Hi guys, welcome to Hippo Brain, where we have hippo sized conversations with people with hippo sized brains. Today is an especially interesting one and extremely special for me because the two people who are going to be my co host and the guest are people because of which I joined the internet revolution. They are the ones that in 1999 we all kicked our FMCG jobs and threw up everything. And by 9900, we were on the digital side. Rajesh, over to you to explain. But I'm so excited today. Thanks a lot, uh, Jamit. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Ram Raj. So, welcome to Hippo Brain, Ram. Thank you. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to have you on Hippo Brain. I think we've known each other for 20 plus years. It's been a long uh, journey together. Uh, uh, as part of SIFI. And then, of course, uh, you've been an advisor to, uh, board advisor to Netcode for uh, 14 years, I think now. Uh, but let me tell you all a little bit about uh, Ram. I think uh, it's been a fascinating journey. He's worn multiple hats through his uh, uh, life. Um, he was associated with Computer Point, which was India's first retail computer retail outlet. And I still remember visiting uh, the outlet uh, which was there at Worli. I don't know, maybe uh, 20, 25, 25 years ago, I think. Uh, and then he was uh, the co-founder of uh, Microland. He also had a stint in the cellular industry. And then came SIFI, uh, which was the amazing journey. And we'll dig deep into uh, the origins of SIFI, how SIFI became the second Indian company to list on NASDAQ in 99, uh, a fascinating journey. And that really ties in with what Jamit said, the origin story of uh, India's internet. And after uh, SIFI, Ram has been associated with multiple different initiatives. Uh, so Olympic, Gold Quest, Sequoia, uh, the global board of ICANN, uh, which administers the internet uh, uh, throughout the world, uh, Rand Institute, Elevar, Equity and uh, I am Calcutta. Uh, so let's start, Ram, with uh, with SIFI. So how did SIFI come about? Satyam Infoway in those days. So I had just got out of the cellular industry. Uh, we had sold what is today Vodafone it was called Sterling Cellular those days. It was the first of two licenses for Delhi, uh, and uh, was at a loose end. Had just taken up a golf membership. Uh, didn't even get a handicap uh, because it was uh, took up too much time, and uh, and then uh, I met up uh, with the Satyam folks at that time, uh, who told me that they had uh, somebody in the New York Stock Exchange area who had come up with a platform, uh, and uh, to compete against Reuters. So as I did my homework to seeing, uh, is there a room for another one? Uh, I suddenly discovered that everybody was happy with the content. Everybody was unhappy with the pipe. It was 64K bringing uh, the content. And everybody said, if you can do something about that pipe, then there is a place. Uh, trying to compete with Reuters uh, may not be the best idea. So it suddenly struck me that Bloomberg wanted to come to India. Many content providers would be coming. And therefore, it was saying, and the purpose that we set for ourselves was to build the information highway for India. Uh, and that looked like one mega dream to do, information highway. And that's how SIFI started. And Ram, to just give a little context, which year was this? 96, 97. Yeah, okay. Sorry, go on. So 97, when we realized uh, 96 end, when we said we'll do this, uh, we suddenly realized that the government had said you can only build X400 networks. Uh, X25, X400, and IP was not allowed. It took about 18 months. Luckily, you know, Montek Singh Alwalia was there uh, in the, what is now uh, in the planning commission at that time. And they came up then with a license. Uh, and as usual, the government said 600 licenses. So in 98, 
It took 18 months. In 98, when they gave 600 licenses, uh, SIFI was one of them. And we suddenly realized that uh, we are now one out of 600. We might have done a lot of the bulwark to get this done, but now we are one out of 600 are back. And execute like hell and differentiate. And so we went about thereafter very quickly executing. And we did a few things then to stand out. Uh, for example, uh, we said that uh, Chandra Babu Naidu was launching the high-tech city. Mr. Vajpayee, the prime minister, was also the communication minister and was coming to inaugurate that high-tech city. So we managed to request Chandra Babu Naidu to hand over the first internet connection to Vajpayee at the high-tech city. We had this huge banner. So they were with these two people. And for the first time, the internet was being made available on a CD. You could just put it into your computer and get connected. Prior to that, you had to put out a demand draft, wait for 15 days, and then maybe you would get the connection, maybe you would not. Uh, and here, suddenly, the internet is on, on a CD. And so that colorful CD with little you know, kites on it, and all of that, so the whole banner and backdrop was colorful with these two gentlemen mm -hmm. and Sifi at the background front page of every newspaper and television channel. Uh, and the high-tech city went to page five, much to the annoyance of the chief minister. But that's how we managed to, to kick off. We suddenly realized having given the net a connection to Mr. Vajpayee, we better have a node in Delhi quickly. Uh, and so we had to execute and have a node up in 48 hours before he started using it. And so, very quickly, we were in six cities to 12 cities and rolling. That's when we realized that a content company, which is what originally we were thinking we would be, uh, had very different capital requirements than an infrastructure company putting pipes uh, across the country. Uh, and, you know, nobody really knew how to do this and to just do that, we needed money. Uh, Citibank gave us some money and came up with a, a new instrument at that time, a convertible debenture. Mm -hmm. But that limited when we got our first set of nodes with that help. Thereafter, we were stuck for capital. That's when we saw that 99 uh, Infosys February had listed on NASDAQ. They were the first company to go list on NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, 99 Israeli companies had listed on NASDAQ. So it prompted us saying, why don't we think of going to NASDAQ? And in October 99, uh, maybe seven, eight months thereafter, we had listed on NASDAQ. And just to add a little context, how big was SIFI at that time? I mean, this is amazing. Second company after Infosys to list. I mean, this is a dream. I mean, how did you even came, come up with the idea of listing on NASDAQ? It was such an ambitious, I mean, it's, it's a dream for any Indian company to be listed there. And there is SIFI probably two years old into the business and on NASDAQ. So many things. First of all, I think even to, uh, to do anything uh, like this, you need to aspire big. The starting point is how do you think as an entrepreneur? Do you aspire? So 600 licenses given, 40 or 50 were national. Uh, the rest were all small, regional, local. So they're not, they were not even thinking. And it was just a bank guarantee uh, that was needed to get that license. Many scramble later to try and see if they could become national or regional or whatever. But starting point was, what is your dream? And if your dream is local, there's no way you're going to think of listing on NASDAQ. Second is that we were thinking that we were actually the first private player to build this network. There was a government BSNL that was there at that time. So if we were the private information highway, then we needed the capital. It was something phenomenal that would transform the GDP of the country. Uh, and therefore, that gave us serious motivation. 
And then we saw 99 small Israeli companies have gone and listed. So why not then try and list ourselves? Uh, there is no capital that was available for a startup uh, at the magnitude at which we wanted. And therefore, I would say really no choice uh, in one way or to say opportunistically, if 99 Israelis and a whole bunch of Chinese can go there, why not us? Uh, and so it was just grabbing an opportunity uh, of, of, of this great uh, uh, lesson that we learned uh, from Infosys and the 99 Israeli companies. So in many, yeah, so in many ways you're saying that uh, uh, aspiring to uh, create an information highway where none exists, aspiring to get capital where none exists is almost an act of patriotism. <laughs> so I can tell you another act of patriotism. Uh, in September, uh, middle or so, maybe towards the end of September, when we started our roadshow, and Jaimit, you will remember, this is 99, and Y2K had not happened. Uh, and Y2K put the Indian IT on the map. Uh, this had not happened. An Indian listed company, Infosys, had listed on NASDAQ. Uh, that's about it. Nobody else had listed on NASDAQ. Uh, so there is no Indian IT that was paving the way for anybody like us to follow. We were the first. And so when we started, we started for capital for SIFI. And every interview was, what do you guys need the internet for? Maybe three, four, five of you speak English. What about the rest of the country? Why aren't you focusing on food? You have cows on the road. And suddenly we realized there is no need to talk about SIFI. We have to first sell the country as a great opportunity. So we suddenly became from SIFI ambassadors to India's ambassadors. And we suddenly got that much more motivated and charged because now we were going to plant the Indian flag at NASDAQ. It was not the SIFI flag, but the Indian flag at NASDAQ. And I tell you, the moment the purpose is something like that, the energy that came through each one of us was totally different. The number of meetings we had, uh, I, after the two weeks, after we listed and celebrated, we came back and collapsed. But during those two weeks, I mean, it was absolutely crazy energy flowing through us. So... Yep. And then within a month and a half or less of listing, uh, you acquired my company, India World. Uh, <laughs> that's an amazing story in itself. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of things, Rajesh, you had asked what was CFI's run rate. It was about a million dollars a year, uh, uh, ramping up, but a million dollars a year. We uh, I had a market cap, see if you had a market cap in October when it listed of $350 million. We computed 20% to get $72 million approximately at that time. Uh, and all of us were overjoyed that we had a successful listing. We now have money in the bank and a $350 million uh, market cap uh, for a million dollar revenue running up, of course. Uh, but then the only guy, I think, in that team who may have been frustrated was me. And it is because I saw that the Chinese companies were all multi-billion dollars. They were multi-billion. And often in the roadshow, we were being compared to China as an opportunity. Uh, and if India was a similar opportunity to China, we were the first out there, why are we not? a billion dollar plus market cap. Uh, thank you for 350, but the frustration was why were we not multi-billion? So it suddenly realized that there was what was called you know, exuberance in the market. If you put a dot com after your name, there was a craze around it and capital was available, which is why we got what we got, but we had not caught the imagination of the investors that India was truly an opportunity. That little tipping point 
of capturing the imagination of global investors had not happened. That yes, it's going to take a long time. These guys don't have computers. They have, you know, I told you the IT industry had not yet come onto the world map. Therefore, we had not triggered the imagination. When we saw India World and saw the number of products that India World had, Babaji, Khel, Koj, Samachar, uh, we were using um, uh, Samachar when we traveled. We suddenly realized that there were 25, 30 properties that this company had. And we said, we need to use this acquisition to trigger that imagination that there's a huge opportunity in India, similar to China. So when we did that acquisition, most acquisitions at that time were happening stock to stock. And it was like monopoly, my funny money to your funny money, because those were crazy valuations. So it didn't matter. I could pay you anything because it was my stock to your stock. But we said that may not trigger the imagination because that would be ticking a box. So we said we would pay cash. Cash of $100 million, where we had only 72, uh, was the first big step. Second, cash. And everybody's attention focused on India world and Rajesh. Nobody looked at why Sifi did it and what happened to Sifi by doing this. It so happened that night of this announcement, Sifi's market cap went up by a billion dollars. And by February, this was done, I think, November and early December. By February, Sifi's market cap had crossed eight and a half billion dollars, at which time eight billion plus. Sifi did a quick follow on, diluted 2%, raised 160 million, and had the ability to pay India World off and cash in the bank. So that we captured at that time with that move, the imagination of the world, uh, it was explosive because suddenly people realized India could be a similar opportunity to China and money started pouring in, entrepreneurship started flourishing around the internet in India, and it just captured the imagination of every investor and every young kid in India. You're right, Ramrat. I was that young kid. So in 98, 99, and I, and I remember this so clearly, that the deal goes through, and it looks like a typo in the, uh, in the newspapers, it is 499 crores and people are like, what the hell is going on? And we all left our jobs and we're going for this gold rush. And to my mind, there are two very important moments for India to be where it is on the digital side. One was Sifi acquiring India World and second are the Flipkart big raises that they used to do. These two paved the way and all of us came in. There was talent coming in. There was money coming in, there were VCs coming in and everybody trying to get a valuation and saying, no, I can do it. No, India can do it. What you're saying is absolutely right. I don't know how many young listeners we have, but to my mind, this was the greatest thing that drove our imagination and we got excited about the internet and the digital space. So what you're saying is, it's so, so true that the, that the fact that, the, that you paid cash broke all our minds and it is probably responsible for where we are today. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just feeling like a kid in a candy store right now with two of my idols over there. But yeah, that, that's, that's, sorry Rajesh, you had a question. I think it's what, what, what is incredible actually is you look at the ambition. I think Ram has always emphasized this, you know, aspiration, the ability to dream big, I mean, just to put this in context, here's a company with a run rate of a million dollars. Imagines it can go to NASDAQ. I mean, in uh, 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 seven months or so, six months after, a uh, few months after Infosys has listed and uh, raises money twice in uh, probably four months time or, or six months time. And uh, uh, that sort of lays the foundation for really building out the internet 
uh, story in India because till that time, all we had was a government uh, provider in VSNL uh, uh, with its internet access uh, that was being offered. And SIFI really uh, captures the imagination of people. Uh, so Ram, one question here, this big thinking, I mean, this, is, this was not ordinary. I mean, most Indian companies are very cautious, very conservative in the way they think. I mean, NASDAQ listing, all of this. How did that come to you? I, you know, I used to work for Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and I, my job was to help bring many of those global products to India. And you go and you run into entrepreneurs around the world who have built these great medical devices that can come. And every one of them is thinking very, very differently and at a scale of global and, and impact. So in one way, I would think I was fortunate to have a global exposure uh, and not just uh, the restricted Indian exposure that we used to have at that time for that generation. Uh, it's very different today. But at that generation, I think I was fortunate to have, uh, which is how Computer Point came about. Uh, so I think it was that uh, exposure to, to global opportunities, global thinking, and to see something like computer retailing happening, uh, to see something like uh, the internet growing in China, in, in the US, uh, and looking at America Online, AOL, and companies like that. Uh, we actually at CIFI had a partnership with CompuServe for the B2B side of the business. So all of this, uh, that partnership happened before the listing because we, they needed a node in India. And so we actually built a world-class uh, network at CIFI uh, because of the partnership. That thinking of a global partner doesn't happen to many, many people. It may happen today, but wouldn't have happened at that time. So partnerships, global thinking, uh, global learning, uh, I think I was fortunate uh, to have that. And two, whatever be it, maybe it's uh, a faulty DNA, fear of failure uh, has really not uh, bothered me. Uh, pick yourself up and move on. So uh, not that you know, one had already failed in, 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 a, in a partnership at one of our earlier companies. One just picked oneself up and moved on. Uh, not that it didn't hurt, but one picked up, learned and moved on. So fear of failure is something that holds every one of us back. And fortunately, that was something that uh, I don't have, didn't have. So that also helped. Uh, just before we went out on this roadshow, you know NASDAQ, uh, what they do for their marketing, so you don't go to New York Stock Exchange, but come to NASDAQ, is they put up your face on that giant screen in Times Square. That is the marketing spiel they give you. And my face did come up and some kid uh, actually saw and called my son and called me on the NASDAQ floor <laughs> because he saw my face. So it actually happened. Uh, that fact that you are going to be on world stage created fear. One of our team members said, I'm, I don't want to come and fail on a giant screen on the world stage. And almost convinced the rest of the team that's not worth their while. So we had to leave him, uh, actually sack him, and then move on. Uh, but fear of failure um, is something that prevents us from testing our potential. Just trying. Uh, we tried and we succeeded. We may not have, but then we would have found something else, I feel. But try. I think fear of failure holds us back. And all time, what's remarkable is also the speed at which you moved. I mean, raising uh, twice on NASDAQ, 225 plus million dollars uh, in the space of six months. The speed is something which is unheard of for Indian companies uh, even now. And this was 20 plus years ago. How did that come about? So two, three things. One, when you have 599 other guys snapping at your heels, <laughs> that helps. Uh, but, I, you know, I, see, the thing is, like I said, we had to go to Hyderabad uh, to launch. So 
Chennai was our first node. We had to have a node quickly in Hyderabad. We had to go to Bangalore. Uh, but immediately after Hyderabad, we had to go to Delhi. Uh, so quickly, we realized that there is a huge demand. And if we don't execute on this, somebody else, we would have created the demand for somebody else to take. Therefore, what happened was that as much as we were, the purpose of building the information highway for India helped us attract a whole bunch of people. Uh, so we had the best of talent. Now, this talent had no clue about the internet business because there was no internet in this country. Except for one guy whom we took from one of the satellite companies who knew, we had to wait for 18 months to get the license. A lot of us, therefore, had spent time learning about the IP and TCP IP and the net. And CompuServe helped uh, a fair bit about on the B2B side. So we actually self-learned and with CompuServe's help, helped learn how to, what is the internet and how do you go about building an information highway. When we look for talent, we look for people who had executed very well on large projects in the B2B, B2C. Um, none of those jargons were, were there at that time uh, to this extent, but yeah, corporate and retail. Uh, and found really good talent that has executed, but not in this space. But they had the ability to manage men and material and people. So we got really outstanding people uh, who came on board because they identified with this purpose of building something that will leave a national footprint. Uh, and that actually is how we had a fantastic team that one could disappear as a startup for four weeks to go and raise capital and not be worried that that $1 million run rate would disappear by the time we came back. On the contrary, it was being built because there was a great team and a small segment could actually go out uh, to go and raise capital. So getting talent and the right kind of talent helps you to go out and uh, build. We had very little money uh, at that time. And so people joined us, some stock options, again, new to the country. Uh, but the whole idea was purpose. A powerful purpose brought the talent. And we were very fortunate with the kind of talent that came on board. And they all executed huge projects very quickly in the offline world. And so that helped build a retail presence, nodes, things like that. Uh, so that's how we were able to, because of the talent we had. So it's interesting. Um, I hear two, two themes. One is you are creating this infrastructure. So at some point, I, I know at that point of time, the focus and verticalization probably did not exist. But I remember buying those, uh, not buying, getting those CDs in the magazine or something like that. So. Sifi was also an internet service provider, but the acquisition was also a content company, which was essentially uh, something different from what you were building out. How in your head the both came, uh, both of these verticals came together to give uh, an offering that you wanted? Because afterwards, uh, I remember seeing the Sifi cafes. So not just creating uh, the information backbone, creating content, and then finally creating access for people. How does this all come together? You seem to have just kept inventing one solution after the other. So one is the partnership with CompuServe helped us build the backbone and the corporate side of the business. Uh, they were in the B2B side. Uh, we built a world-class network because we just copied what they told us. They connected us to their vendors. So it was seamless integration. So any multinational in India could now connect. Therefore, the B2B side just took off. AOL was the other company we went after because AOL were the ones who actually sold the internet on CDs. 
uh, and AOL had caught the imagination of the American market and the global market by being retail rather than B2B. CompuServe was profitable, AOL was not at that time, but was building a fantastic market presence and computer acceptance. So we said, the whole idea is that the business side, so we had a quality network, we had business revenue coming in, and the whole idea was to get the internet to the consumer. And therefore we had a different division and focus which is where we brought in the FMCG people to help create this whole category of going out to the consumer. Uh, AOL bought CompuServe. So that helped. Uh, because then we said, hey, there is an integration that is possible. Plus, once you have the information highway, what are all the services that you can do on this? So if we launched a whole bunch of e-commerce services with no proper payment gateways and stuff that we all take for granted today, but marketplaces for you know commodity trading, tea trading, metal trading, a whole lot of stuff uh, that people picked up and tried to build businesses around. Uh, in a way that might have been too thin uh, and focus might have helped, but at a high level, B2B and B2C, reaching out to consumers on this infrastructure that you built, there was a Harvard paper that had come out saying that for developing countries, Leveraging their in infrastructure over multiple businesses is the best way to go for developing economies uh, and not to rebuild everything uh, in small niches. Uh, and therefore, this seemed to again trigger. Uh, we had Krishna Palepu uh, as uh, somebody we knew from Harvard at that time. And these were some of the, the thought leadership that was happening. How do you leverage infrastructure in a developing country across multiple revenues. So that was one. After we came back uh, with the capital, uh, we suddenly realized there were not enough computers in the country. So while we were, the companies were buying computers, people who at home didn't have enough computers. So how on earth are we going to meet our commitments of growth and all of that in the market? And so we brought in somebody who had done uh, franchising. Uh, and built retail franchise and set up uh, SIFI's uh, uh, highways, as they were called. Again, in order to get to as many young people as possible, put up 5,000 highways in 18 months. Uh, cookie cutter, McDonald's style, look similar. So, you know, central manufacturing of furniture, buying of computers, networks, everything and rolling it out. So there was a team that standardized, a team that rolled out, finding the right location, right partner uh, for franchise. Uh, because we had this franchise expert who joined us, we were able to do that. Otherwise, there was no consumer market of scale if we didn't create the category. So we actually had to create the category uh, to get the uh, people to use the internet. So therefore, highways came up. Uh, and to get people to come to the highway so that mothers would let their children come to the highway and not be playing games only. So while we had fantastic games, we had to say it's educational and had to teach something that was programming or something, uh, including English. Uh, many day traders used highways because high speed, uh, predictable, dependable connectivity, air condition. The only thing we didn't have was uh, food, but everything else was available and, and you could actually do your work from there. So, yep, we created a category. I think it's a remarkable story of so many firsts. I mean, for everyone who sees the internet today in 2020, I think the, the number of firsts that you did, Ram, in that uh, 99 to 2005, six period uh, was simply remarkable. And uh, the cutting edge really was pushed and in many different directions. And I can vouch, I mean, the quality of talent uh, that you had assembled was, was absolutely remarkable. And uh, I think one of the things you used to tell us a lot at that time uh, is this, uh, the whole thing around purpose and a shared vision. I still remember the session, uh, Jim Collins's book, 
uh, you have told us all to read uh, build, build a good build to last and uh, the idea that how do you build a great company you know with a shared vision talk a little about that see the all of us spend so much time at work and unless and until the asset test is do you look forward to monday mornings or not when you are working uh, are incentives the only things that get you to work uh, if it is incentives only then it's not going to last there is the law of diminishing returns and all of which we have studied so you have to keep changing you know those quality of incentives quantum of incentives and, and you know hr is breaking their head how do you transform that to initiate how can it be that without the risk of being an entrepreneur you can still be entrepreneurial in what you do how can you create an environment where you allow somebody's creativity their own decision making to actually happen the challenge comes when mistakes are made everybody knows this is simple to know and everybody the problem happens when mistakes are made moment mistakes are made then we stop that person with both feet and everybody is watching the response to mistakes if we can find a way that the whole organization and that individual learns from that mistake and learn and move we actually have great talent because that person or people have now learned you know how to manage risk the company's objective is to manage the risk so that these experiments that fail don't kill the company uh and so you manage the risk by you know testing google's 20% equivalent uh of giving away 20% of time and look at all the kind of products that have come out of it and this is way before uh everybody has said g jack welch used to say i wish we had the entrepreneurial talent uh rather than this large company and how do we keep that and the only way is to make sure that people have the initiative the experiment they try they have the authority to take decisions and you don't kill them when they make mistakes you help learn the organization learns you institutionalize learning and you move on that is how i think we had great talent and great commitment to work you know we didn't it didn't matter that you had to have somebody logging in at 9 in the morning and 5 in the evening none of that was required you may come at 11 12 it didn't matter you you took charge of the outcome of your work in your team's work uh, and that's it you could work forever the, it was running 24 by 7 because it had data centers so the culture of helping people come out and take risks be entrepreneurial in a corporate environment so that their risks were managed uh, made them feel good empowered and creative and motivated yeah um this is very interesting because in 9900 whatever you saying today i think ceos and people like us and other management keep talking about it they allow you to take risks allow you to make mistakes i think in in those days i think when i started my career if somebody said like this the person was probably from mars <laughs> but a um, uh, little more grounded in that sense is i appreciate that the culture has to be created what i can't understand is how can you give us some practical insights on how did you try and create that because it's very easy for us to probably play lip service to your vision but very difficult for us to actually implement it how do i create a culture that allows so any any practical examples that you can think of that you brought about at cfi so for example uh i was okay together we worked out the strategy so you now know what has to be done now very easily one could get engaged with the color you know of the table uh what that chair should be ergonomically designed god only knows what 
uh, it is very tempting uh, to get into many of these things. All that I did was that when they had something, I would just go look at it, see that it is, you know, of a standard that will keep it global. It would attract kids into the place, bright, colorful, and everybody knew it. And they knew more about color and creativity coming from, you know, advertising, FMCG. They knew more about it than I did. So I just went in to see that budgets were, were managed, that compliance was there. You know, there is cross-border we have to send from state to state. Those days it was really painful. So, you know, what are you doing about some of that? Just to see compliance and, and that budgets were being met. And even that is just a conversation saying, guys, how are we on budget? And they found the most optimal costs. They were more keen than me because they had to show that they could do this. They were coming from a consumer industry, from FMCG, where they were very successful into the internet industry. And they had to show that they could adapt, they could succeed. They were seriously motivated to show that they knew. And they knew everything about budgeting, because that's what large multinationals treat them. They knew about costs very well. And they knew how to roll out very quickly across all these borders and taxes and everything. All that one did was be there, make sure compliance is there, make sure the team had the resources and back off. Very tempted to say, why not green, blue, yellow? Uh, any advertising, we are all experts. Any design, we are all experts. Just backing off and, and hold my tongue uh, and, and stay away. Uh, not easy, not easy, especially, you know, the first set of tables, one of our colleagues, her sari got torn because the corner of the table was sharp. That was it. Of course, she said, if I were in the US, I would have sued you all. <laughs> but <laughs> because this is, you know, the greatest sari I ever wore. But it was a lesson to them. Immediately, all corners got rounded. So they learned like that on the job quickly because that's the environment. You learn instead of being defensive and saying, oh shit, what happened? Very quickly that became a lesson to learn and implement uh, and move on. Uh, and, and they gifted a rasari at the end of it all. So <laughs> for teaching them that imagine if the consumers got hurt. So it, luckily it was in the office. So learning, observing. We talk about innovation as something that is key. Innovation happens like this. That, that rounded edge came by observation, by learning, quickly adapting. Ma'am, if I if we move on to a slightly different track, but building on what you, what you just said, I think in, in, you've seen, you created this amazing entrepreneurial culture at SIFI. And after that, you've been involved with entrepreneurs for the past 15 years, uh, even after you've left SIFI. As an investor, as an angel investor on boards of various companies. So what are some of your key learnings? You know, uh, the entrepreneur's journey is, a lot of it is about failure. You talked about the fear of failure. There is a risk of failure. Entrepreneurs go to work every day, working to reduce the risk of failure. So what are a few takeaways that you have seen in your life, which can be helpful advice for entrepreneurs? I would think starting point is uh, dream big. Uh, if you don't even aspire big, uh, you know, we've all heard the same for the moon, yeah, that you may get something closer home, but if you don't, don't even have the aspiration, the kind of funding you will do, the kind of talent you will bring, all of which gets limited by that dream. So starting point is aspiration uh, and ambition. Many a time I find that maybe because of, you know, at least the early days, because of the 
limited environment of licensing and regulation, one has not really thought blue sky enough. I think the environment has changed. It's socially acceptable today to be an entrepreneur. There is so much of an enabling environment, so different from the last 15, 20 years, that there is really no limit to dreaming big. So starting point is dreaming. Second is, while you may use headhunters and HR and everything to bring in key talent, key talent will come in because you can sell a story. It is your story, the reason you gave up something to take this on. Uh, you thought that this could make a difference to people's lives. Therefore, you have pursuing this as full time. It's a passion. That passion can be shared only by the entrepreneur. Key talent hire has to be done by the entrepreneur. Sifi was scaling like crazy, as we all have seen in the past. Management trainees, who I thought would be very quickly the future leaders, considering that the internet needed younger minds to actually uh, capture that imagination and do things, we wanted a lot of young talent. In the early years, even management trainees, just to get the brightest of management trainees to join SIFI, I would go with HR to recruit, uh, just to make sure. And it, it, it took up time, which could have been used maybe in building the business, but this is building the future. Uh, and therefore, spending a lot of time on talent personally makes a huge difference because you will be out spend raising capital and networking and making sure that you open doors with key customers. Business has to run and you need to be able to leave that and move on. If you have the right talent, you can. Three is capital. Uh, either you can do it, you know, Zoho has done it by not raising external capital, but I think these are exceptions. It depends on the timelines, competition. Today, your idea can be copied in no time. So raise capital and raise it, I would think, uh, as quickly as possible and as often as possible. And the reason I'm saying often is because if you're really scaling, then your valuation keeps changing every 12 months, 18 months. So if you keep raising small chunks of capital often enough, then you know, you'll be raising it at different valuation. But like Sifi, there was some irrational exuberance going on. It was crazy, crazy times. It hasn't come back uh, yet. Uh, even though valuations are crazy, it's not that exuberance yet. Uh, and at that time, if you don't raise maximum capital, then you would have missed a golden opportunity because there was a crash. Uh, and then you wouldn't have been able to raise. Of the 600, only one raised capital outside on NASDAQ. 599 could have. Why didn't they? Uh, maybe they were too slow, maybe there was fear, uh, but uh, the fact that you have to be opportunistic and grab with both hands at such times, crazy times, ride the wave. Uh, if you don't ride the wave, the wave is going to land on you and then you are in trouble. Because if he had the money, the 220 plus million dollars, it could ride uh, the dot-com bust. Uh, it had credibility with large corporate customers whose networks were being run by SIFI. Therefore, it had large offices, large data centers, where people were invited to come and see. Uh, and therefore, raising capital helped protect. And the company is now only in the data center and corporate business, extremely profitable and continuing. So it's not that it was a person dependent. It's continuing very profitable, different business, uh, to drop some, enhance some. But because there was capital raised at the right time, it's become an institution that is staying. So yeah, these were maybe three. And uh, when you look back, um, uh, any of the mistakes that you think uh, that you've made over a period of time and some light on that as well? And uh, while you're at it, any mistakes that today young entrepreneurs that you see can avoid? So I can tell you one mistake that I still regret. You know, Rajesh spoke about the speed of execution. 
Siffy was executing like crazy, had a market cap after it raised at 8 billion, it had raised second round of capital. The market cap climbed to 11 and a half billion dollars. Uh, AOL bought Time Warner and got serious revenue. So Siffy then decided it should buy a company uh, related, uh, but offline, to get serious revenue because that would give it stability while you built out over time a proper profitable internet business. We were working with merchant bankers who helped take us to NASDAQ and moved really quickly. They understood speed, execution, and we were executing whether it was by of India world or the next round or talent or 18 months of highway, everything was super quick. At which time, one of the largest consulting companies came in to say, uh, we would like to help you with your strategy. Uh, nobody knew about the internet. I assume these guys at the Global Connect, they, they didn't. They were just learning. And they said, we will help you find this as part of our strategy to help you find this great company. Nine months, I went around with them around the world and met a lot of their ex-colleagues and all that in different CEO positions. Uh, we missed the acquisition. If I had stayed with that existing successful team that had done all this, we would have had a different CFI today. And where did we go wrong? Because we had 11 and a half billion market cap, we suddenly became corporate in our team. <clears throat> we lost that entrepreneurial edge. That was actually the success mantra. And suddenly we lost that because we said, oh, this large consulting company is what you should do because you're now a large corporate, which is absolute bullshit. Uh, and that is where we make the mistake. What is it? Are those few key core things that have helped you succeed? And that is really core value. And not to lose that. So I would think getting flattered by the wooing of these large consulting guys. And who did it only for their learning and very little for the company. Uh, it's, uh, it was fatal, I would think. It's just that because there was cash in the bank, we survived and built a company. But otherwise, it could have been fatal, losing that uh, entrepreneurial energy that the company had and the ability to execute. That, I think, was, was a blunder. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's pretty interesting what you're saying. In losing your... Uh, culture to the suits in some way yep. uh, is 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 very very expensive. Um, just trying to uh, circle back to uh, changing tracks rather. Um, over a period of time, is there a recurring theme that bugs you or irritates you, or <laughs> or something that still gets your goose today? I uh, maybe it's a. Maybe it's a bug, uh, as you said. I somehow think uh, anybody, if they put their heart and soul, can do anything. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, mechanical engineer, writes the best code today. He just decided that he wants to learn it and manage it, writes the best code. Opportunities. You know, we've seen people who have come in, adapted to the industry and built great businesses. So for me, that thing is that don't let, uh, don't, I, I think it's called limitation of beliefs or something like that, where you, you limit your own potential because of you putting boundaries around your capabilities. Uh, I had somebody who did, what, who did a M-Tech in IIT on computer science. This was part of our CIFI's program where we wanted him to learn about sales and this and that. Just go around two to two, two weeks. 
He said, I didn't do an MTech in computer science to go around learning about sales and marketing and a customer. Now that guy is walking dead in my mind because he doesn't have a mental attitude of openness and learning and relearning, which is what we say is the key to succeed. So to me, that attitude of not wanting to constantly learn, it doesn't matter what the age is, what the experience is. The kid today knows far more than I do about the digital world. It's natural for them. And if I don't use that opportunity to learn, so that limiting beliefs that actually limit your potential and your ability to do things is the most frustrating thing that bugs me when I meet people, especially young people. So remove that and move on. So, yep, that is one big bug. Now, one of the, uh, as we reach our sort of closing, um, one of the things I also wanted to ask you is uh, about Vedanta. You've been uh, a follower of Swami Parthasati and uh, the Vedanta philosophy. And I think uh, uh, it'll be great to hear from you what sort of attracted you, what do you think are the key tenets? So for people out there, I think uh, it'll be a great sort of introduction to something different in their lives. So when I first went to listen to Swamiji, my mother told me, I was 33 or 34 at that time, my mother told me, why do you want to go and do this at this age? Uh, wait till you retire to pick up these books on spirituality. Whereas somebody like Swami Parthasarthi says, the younger you are, the better you are. Because I learned, and his key focus is, you need, we learned engineering, we have learned a whole lot of stuff. We don't have the skills to maintain a relationship. Uh, we don't have a skill to be dynamic and happy and not have a heart attack. We either are driving ourselves to crazy ambitions and having bypasses as a byproduct. Uh, is there a way that you can be dynamic and happy and cheerful all the time? And they, this is not taught. And according to him, and what little I've learned from him, is that it's a technique, a skill that can be learned. And the younger you learn it, the greater is your quality of action. The whole thing is about we have to make choices every moment of our life. What is the basis on which we make these choices? Do we use only emotion or is there a rational and can we have a combination of these two to be able to take these choices? Uh, to be or not to be equivalent, but that's at a different level. <laughs> but the idea is on what basis do we act? On what basis do we take our choices? What skills have we got? And this entire philosophy teaches us how, what is right action and how to take it, how to make these choices. And it's got nothing to do, and there's nothing wrong with religion, but it's got nothing to do with religion. It's got everything to do with the quality of your action, the quality of your relationship, relationships, and how on earth can you be dynamic? How can you look forward to Monday mornings? How can you create initiative in you? So it is all about self-development and your contact with everybody else, which we do. Uh, so that is really uh, what this has helped uh, to a great extent. Uh, and that is how to the basis for better choices and the basis for right action. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. The basis for right action and choosing. And uh, I think my last uh, question to you would be before I think if Rajesh has any, is that is there uh, today you're looking at a lot of young startups and you're looking at a lot of young people trying to do, uh, trying to achieve what is that one quality? I'm trying to put you on the dock and say, can you give me one? If you can give me two, I would not be so happy. But is, is it that one quality or one thing that you look at when you're looking for a one for the entrepreneur uh, and you think this man or this guy or this girl is going to succeed? 
ability to be pragmatic about your idea. While you can dream and dream big, most of us miss the go-to-market. And go-to-market is actually, is there a difference in my idea? And how do I take it to market? And so what one looks for is somebody whose feet is on the ground and head is in the cloud. So. I think on that note, Ram, it's been a fantastic uh, hippo brain conversation. I think so many takeaways at so many different levels. I think this should be one for the ages in terms of your journey at, at SIFI, the whole uh, aspiration element that you talked about. I think it's, uh, it's a lot missing. I mean, we, we get so caught up today in what we are doing next quarter, uh, next month. Uh, but the ability to dream big, to be able to tell that story, the ability to attract the best talent, uh, and then put a team and then execute uh, with the sense of purpose and keeping that entrepreneurial spirit uh, within the organization. I mean, I still have wonderful memories of the two years uh, uh, that I spent uh, with you in SIFI. And of course, the wisdom that we get from you at uh, every one of our uh, board reviews. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much for that. And uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Janet. Yeah, I'd like to just end with, uh, it has been the yin and yang of uh, management in some ways today. I think the ability for Ram to take two opposite things and so easily uh, put it all together. I want fast, I want speed, I want ruthlessness of execution. I want purpose, I want the world and the, and the country to move forward. We want to sell Sifi, but we all have to sell India. We have to think big, but we need to have a story that people want. We need to have that talent that we're going to attract, but we want to give them freedom. We want to give them the ability to, uh, to, to make their mistakes while doing fast. And I think it's just that at the end of it, you say, yes, be practical. You can dream as much as you want, but be practical. I don't know. <laughs> we mere mortals are struggling to, to, to try and figure out okay, how can you get both of these? How can you put them together? And how, can the, how the hell does this happen? But I think when one looks at you and looks at the journeys and the impossibilities that you have achieved, the impossibilities of India, may internet can we have internet? Will Indians access the internet? Another impossibility. We have to stand in line at the VSNL offices. No, here is a CD and it's going to come to you. The fact that that beautiful CD with a kite was given to Vajpayee and it fired all our imaginations. And if that wasn't enough, you go and buy India World, all cash, fire everybody's imagination to be an entrepreneur and to make it all work and the speed at which you execute it. I think all of these seemingly opposites coming together to create a company and the management lessons and at the end of it to say, yes, sir, okay. spirituality that underpins it is something crazy. I think it's, it's a difficult task for someone like me, <laughs> but it's something that I can dream of and that, that's something that I can dream to be. And it's, it's a great lesson that I've taken away today. Thanks you. Thank you, Ram. Outstanding. Thank you. Enjoy the conversation. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, for all you guys, again, remember, uh, subscribe to Hippobrain on YouTube. It's available wherever you get your podcast. Yes, you have to click on that bell icon. It's damn funny. Statistics have proven that those who subscribe to Hippobrain are more likely to get at least 30 to 40% increase in salaries than people who don't subscribe to Hippobrain. That is an absolute fact, if you believe me. So thanks a lot. And thank you for listening to us. We hope to have you again and again for more such Hippobrain conversations, hippo-sized conversations with people with hippo-sized brains. Thank you.